So, with a, so here's a quick question on IRR. Say you invest $100 today, and I don't want anybody shouting out the answer, I just want you to think about it, and then I'll pick on you. So at time zero, you invest $100, and then at the end of year two, you get back 140, nothing happens in between, okay? So the IRR of this project is, so write your answer down. Okay, so here the IRR is about, about uh, you know, slightly less than 20%. What's wrong with saying 40%? What is wrong is that with 40 percent, you would you are stating a holding period return. Okay, you are stating with 40 percent, you are effectively stating that my return over a two-year period is 40 percent. So, is it okay to say that my return over two years is 40 percent? No. Yeah. So you can say that over a two-year period, my return is 40 percent. Is it is it okay to say that my return is 40 percent? No. No, because when you say my return is something. The, your audience will assume that you are giving them a, an annualized number. And when you state an IRR, IRR by definition is supposed to be a annualized number unless you explicitly state otherwise. Yes. Yeah, sir. Yeah, uh, I don't understand your question. Okay, so this, okay, so this is another very basic point. Uh, how many people can set up for both, let's say this is question one. And this is question two. How would you come up with the exact? I came up with 20% as an approximation. If I ask you to give me an answer correct to two decimal places, what will you do? Then you can't say 20% because while that would be close, you no, know, it's a very simple mathematical thing to do. So let's see how many people can. If you can't write this down, then we have a larger issue. So let's. Yeah, answer? For the second. Okay, all. all all, all we are doing over here is saying 140 is equal to 100 into 1 plus r squared and you calculate the r. So, and what you will get is something slightly less than 20 percent. Or do So, 200 is equal to 100 into 1 plus r to the power of 10 and then you calculate the r. Okay, so it should be. Intuitively, you should know that it's going to be less than than 10 percent. Okay, so uh, just a basic. And then, uh, so Usman, what's the IRR rule? That's uh, you know? Ayub, sorry. What's the IRR rule? Uh, so beyond what uh, Basit. Exactly. So the IRR rule is to select a project. IRR should be greater than cost of capital. Yeah, you knew that. Okay, so we went over the NPV method. So you understood NPV, you understood IRR. Uh, conceptually, what is uh, IRR next to Basit is? Hussein. Hus Hussein. So what is conceptually, if you are to explain to your boss who doesn't know much finance, you are telling him that IRR of a project is 14%. And then he says, what is IRR? What will you say? Exactly. So the simplified way is that on an annual basis, this is the return I am getting. Good. Okay, we've done all this. Okay, then we were right here. So as a quick recap, what do we mean by a NPV profile? It's plotting the NPV of a project against a discount rate. So we had two projects, S and L. Okay, I one of these days I need to memorize this, but what was our uh, cash flows for each one of these? For project S, 70, 50, 20, and for the next project we have 60, 80. Okay, if you were to ask an accountant who doesn't understand time value of money, which project is better? What will he say? He'll say that uh, S is better. Why will he say that? Actually, what the accountant is, you know, I don't, so in, in America, accountants are often called bean counters. So what they'll do is they'll just count. Okay, so, so they'll count 70 plus 50 plus 20, which is 140. So an accountant will say, okay, on project S, I'm investing 100 and getting 140. For project L, he'll say, okay, I invest 100 and I get 150. So an accountant will pick 
L. L. Okay. So, is he right or is he wrong? It depends. Okay. So, so it depends. Okay. So, I'm just building up. I'm building up on something. So, just follow the follow the thinking here. So, if you don't take time value of money into account, then which project is better? L. And not taking time value of money into account is like saying that the discount rate is zero. Okay. So, notice that if the discount rate is zero then effectively the accountant only thinks along this one dimension, right? Okay, where the discount rate is zero. So, so he will think that this project L is better because he is getting more money. And let's say that in reality, the interest rate is a small rate of say 5%. Okay, so in both these projects, is the initial investment the same? The initial investment is the same. But is there a difference in the timing of cash flows? Okay, which project is getting you your money back faster? So project S is getting your money back faster. So keep that at the back of your mind. Okay, in project, if you are working in an environment where interest rates are relatively low, then the benefit of getting money back faster is not as much. Did you understand that statement? So in a low interest rate environment, even if you are getting some money in the future, the present value of that today is substantial. So in a low interest rate environment, by and large, your accountant will be correct because if interest rates are low, then the project where overall you are getting more money, even though you are getting money later, but by and large project L is better. Okay. But what if we are in an environment such as Pakistan where interest rates are high? So the cost of capital is relatively high. So if the cost of capital is relatively high, then what happens? Which project becomes better? Yeah, then project S becomes better. So overall, with Project S, you are getting less money. But if interest rates are high, Project S is better. Conceptually, why is that? So in front of Omar in the blue t-shirt? No, behind you. What's your name? Zulfikar. So why, why conceptually is Project S better if you are in, a, in this region? Are interest rates, is the rate high? Yeah, that is strictly speaking correct, but conceptually ne next to Omar is, uh, next to Zulfikar is Hassan. So you want to build on what Zulfikar just said? No, the, yeah, the, the, the whole point is that if interest rates are high, then the value of this lots of money in the future is very low today. Yeah, so do you, do you get one core point out of this? that if you are operating in a high, if interest rates are high, then the present value of these big cash flows in the future, the present value is low. So in a high interest rate environment, what do you prefer? Cash flow sooner or later? Yes. Yeah, so actually you always prefer sooner cash flows, but the importance of getting cash flow sooner becomes much more as interest rates go up. Okay, so clearly the timing of cash flow is, is important in making your decision. Okay, and it is because, do you notice that it is the difference in timing because of which we have a crossover? Okay, so if you have two projects, in project L you are getting more money, but that money is being received later. Okay, it is because of that differences in the timing of cash flow between L and S that we have the crossover. Do you understand that profound statement? Okay, okay, so I'll just make a statement and then explain it again. The statement is that it is because of the difference in the timing of cash flow that we have this crossover. Okay, do you... In, 
so so actually it is it is because because of actually if the if the timing had been so if i make another project w where again you invest 100 but in project w the timing of the cash flow is somewhat similar so let's say in w you have 80 and then 50 and then 20 okay so project w is sort of the timing is sort of like s where you get more money up front so will project s and w have a crossover how many people think w and s will have a crossover so quickly draw just conceptually i want you to do this so draw your npv profile for s alone don't do l uh, uh, so 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 then draw the line for project the profile for project w do it yeah, but I will ask you something. I will ask you something. By the way, this chapter is a quiz in the class. Mein, so you better, you know, uh, it's already, you know, decreed. Okay, so now how do, we, how do we come up with the profile of W? What is the, what is the intercept? So W, ka, let's do it in red. So this is the first so at at five percent discount rate, what would W be? Huh? So you would do minus hundred plus eighty over one point. So kya answer aaya? Thirty-eight or something. So then you have a point over here. At say ten percent, what do you get? So at ten percent, you will have twenty-nine something over here. And then at fifteen percent. So, so if you plot it, you will notice that it will generally plot over the, over the blue S line. So, and why can you see that? You are getting your money back faster just like in S, but you are getting back more money. So if in two projects, you are getting back more money sooner, but in project W, you are, you know, at each time point, the money that you are getting is a little more. Clearly, it's a better project at all rates do you get that point okay so there is no so it's actually a no-brainer or it should have been a no-brainer okay yeah w is something like this so it generally stay will w have a a higher irr so that means that the x-axis intersect intercept is after this what about the y-axis intercept is that higher than because the undiscounted cash flows are higher. And then you've drawn a few points. So clearly it is higher. Is it conceivable that something as simple as this will, you know, suddenly in the middle do something stupid like that? No. So there is no way that, yeah, they will not even touch. They might come close, but they won't touch. Hmm? They won't touch because at any discount rate, the NPV of W will always be more. So then if we are plotting NPV against discount rate, and at every discount rate the NPV of W is higher, then how will they touch? Answer is they will not. Yeah, Do that for homework. Do it after class. Okay, now what all this explanation was to illustrate a very basic point that NPV profiles intersect or have a crossover. What's the definition of a crossover? Yeah, the man. Okay, and how would you calculate that, Muhammad Ali? How would you, if I gave you two projects and asked you for the NPV or the crossover point, which is a high probability question on your quiz, what is, uh, how do you come up with the crossover point? What are, what are two, three ways of doing it? You can start, okay, find the IRR, okay. Awesome. Okay, so the, 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 the quick answer is, the, the, one answer is you draw the NPV profile for both and see where they intersect. What about the other method is, yeah, you can do trial and error, you can come up with the NPV of this in terms of R, in terms of discount rate. So what's the, what's the NPV of project S in terms of R? It's going to be minus 100 over, over 1. 
plus 70 over 1 plus R plus the rest of the cash flows, that is equal to minus 100 plus 10 over 1 plus R and so on. And you figure out what R, at what R will this equation work. Hmm? This is a lengthy process, so you do it with trial and error. I'm not going to give you anything too elaborate, but you can just quickly draw profiles and approximately come up with with this. Even finding the IRR initially is not that easy mathematically. Conceptually it is straightforward. On a calculator it is straightforward. But uh, all you are doing is coming up. So the two methods very briefly. One is to come up with the two graphs, the two profiles and the intersect is the NPV profile. The, the other method is to come up with an equation and that equation solve for R that will tell you the crossover point. Yeah, Omar. That is correct. You are not drawing it perfect. Yeah, it's an, so that's on the exam you need to illustrate that you know the concept at home or at your work you will do it on a computer. So you can you can come up with the NPVs at different points. Okay, any anyway, financial calculator questions after class. Okay, so why am I doing all this? Do you illustrate just to illustrate one core point that does the timing because of the timing of cash flows we have the crossover. Okay, so crossover point happens because of the differences in the timing of cash flows. Okay, so uh, okay, this part I actually talked about last time. If projects are independent, the two methods, which two methods? Yeah, so NPV and IRR will always give you the same result. But if projects are mutually exclusive, do they give you the same result? It depends on the interest rate, on the discount rate. Okay, we did this last time. If we are to the left of the crossover point, they give a conflict. When there is a conflict, then what do we do, Isa? Yeah, so when there is a conflict, go with NPV. Okay, and we have talked about finding the crossover point. You can either just equate the NPVs and solve for R, or you can look at the profile. Okay, why do we have a crossover? We have talked about timing differences. Projects with faster payback provide more cash flow in early years for reinvestment. So the point is this, if interest rates are high, then you prefer projects which give you your money back faster because that money can then be reinvested. If interest rates are low, then it's not such a big advantage to get your money back faster. So this we did. The other one I want you to do at home and, and I'm going to ask about this in the next class where even size or scale differences, what does it mean? What do size or scale differences mean? So Farhad, what does the size or scale difference between projects mean? Actually this means, typically it means the investment. So on large projects you are investing more money. In like if you have project A and B, in project A you invest 1 million, in project B you invest 20 million. The scale of this project is, is much large. If discount rates are very high, then would you all else equal, if discount rates or the interest rates are very high, then which project do you think you will have preferences for? Smaller projects or larger projects? Actually, all else equal, with, when interest rates are high, the opportunity cost of using up your money is very high. Okay, so that also creates a... You need a higher return. Exactly. So if interest rates are high, then this big project better give you a very high return in order to go with it. The homework that I want you to do is... In, in the project S and L, was there a difference in the timing of cash flows? Yes. There was. Yes. Was there a difference in scale? Yes. No, in both you were investing in 100. In one you were just getting a little bit, like 10 more. Okay, so for, the home, for homework, I want you to come up with two possible projects where there is a difference in scale and you draw the so project A and project B difference in scale and come up with cash flows that allow you to that, that show a crossover okay so you do this I will pick people if, if I 
pick you and you get it right, you get a bonus mark. If I pick you and you get it wrong, then you get a negative mark. Okay, so carrot as well as stick, both there. If you didn't understand the problem, then you see me after class. Okay, now, why do you think we prefer NPV over IRR? The answer is that NPV is a theoretically superior method. Why is it superior? We are going to go over that. So, so for the next 10 minutes, just listen and then after that you can ask questions. Okay, when you do a simple project where at time zero, say you invest 100, and then you have cash flows of say 80, 20 and, and 10. The question is what happens with these intermediate cash flows? Are they thrown away and spent or are they reinvested? They are reinvested. Okay, now if you are making the correct observation that they are reinvested, the next question is reinvested at what rate? Okay, so when you start a project, you don't know the current market rate. So you are evaluating a project at time zero. And very simplistically, so far we've talked about two rates. One is the VAC, let's say that's 10%. And I don't know the exact IRR for this, but one of our projects had an IRR of say 20%. So the two, rate, the two rates that are relevant here, one is 20% and one is 10%. 10% represents your cost of capital. The NPV method assumes that your money that you generate in between is reinvested at the cost of capital. IRR assumes, the, the whole calculation behind IRR assumes that any money reinvested is reinvested at the IRR rate. Okay, now the NPV assumption is theoretically the correct assumption. The IRR assumption is an incorrect assumption. And that is one reason why the IRR method is somewhat defective. Okay, IRR incorrectly assumes that your cash flows are reinvested at a IRR rate. So the point here is that if you are assuming that these intermediate cash flows are reinvested at a higher rate, that means that the IRR that you are calculating is overstated. It is overstated if your IRR is greater than VAC. Okay, so I'll say the whole thing again because it's critical. With NPV, with the NPV method, we correctly assume that intermediate cash flows are reinvested at the cost of capital. With the IRR method, we incorrectly assume that intermediate cash flows are reinvested at the IRR rate. Okay, so, so that's why, among other reasons, NPV is considered a superior method. Okay. Now, okay, very, very good question. So that, that actually what I'm trying to do is dispel that incorrect assumption. Okay, so, and let me illustrate this with a simple example. Okay, I hope others are following that question because what you just said, actually most people think that but do not articulate it. Okay, so what, what Temur just said is that if you have a very simple project such as this, where let's say you invest 100 and after one year, let's say that you get 80 and after year two, you get 80. The question is what is really happening with this 80 that you generate? Does it just sit around and stay at 80 or is it, is it reinvested? The assumption when you come up with IRR and NPV is that it is reinvested. And to prove that to you, let's say that we first look at, uh, assume a discount rate of 10%. Okay. Now, how will you calculate the NPV of this project? The NPV of this project is going to be minus 100 plus 80 over 1.1 plus 80 over... 1.1 squared and since we are doing this most people think that okay this 80 comes in and then we are not doing anything with the 80 but what I'm going to show you is the same thing in two different ways can somebody who is fast with the calculator quickly give me the answer for this 
this NPV for this red project. And while somebody is doing this, I want somebody else uh, to actually, so Sadek, can you do this for the same project? So this is how much? <coughs> okay, now another way of looking at this project is to say how much money will you have over here at the end. So what's the future value at time two of the same cash flow? So this you are compounding forward now. So what's the future value at time two, assuming again a rate of 10%? So are you sure? So minus 100, yeah, that sounds better. How come I'm getting all different answers? So I want at least two or three people to give me the same answer. So what is minus 100 compounded forward? So how much, how much money, what's it? So what is the 80 present, the future value of 80 over here? 80. What is the value of 80? So, so 80 plus 88 and then what about minus? So how much do you get? 47. So are we assuming that the 80 is being reinvested? Right. Now if you take the present value of 47 back at time 0, what do you get? You should get about 38. Okay. So in both cases you get the same. So Temu, do you, do you see that actually our assumption throughout is that the 80 doesn't just sit idle. It is actually being reinvested. Now, if I ask you to calculate the present value in general, will you do this method on the left or will you do the rigmarole on the right? You do the left. But why did I do this on the right? It is simply an academic illustration to prove and to convince you once at least that the money that is generated in between is actually not sitting idle, it's being reinvested. Okay, so in this NPV method, what assumption have we made about the rate at which AT is reinvested? Yeah, it is reinvested at WAC. Now, can you calculate the IRR for this project? Okay, because how did you get the, did you get 47 by, the question is how do we prove that money is reinvested? One second, let me answer that question first. So, isn't the 80 reinvested to get 47? No, so just one, one at a time. So, when you came up with the future value of 47, are you not assuming that this 80 is reinvested? Okay, so, so we are assuming that the 80 is reinvested and then that's, so we have to make that assumption in order to come up with it. Okay, so that depends on, uh, okay. Okay, so the question is what really happens. Now, take a larger picture. Why do we do NPV and IRR? The reason we do it is to figure out whether to select a project or not to select. And when are you making this decision? At time zero, one or two? Zero. So whenever you are making a decision at time zero, do you need to make assumptions about what will happen in the future? Okay, you have to, otherwise, if you don't make any assumptions, then you can't make decisions. Okay, so if you know, if you are making an assumption that you are going to get 80 after one year, then you need to make an assumption as to whether or not you will reinvest. And in the NPV method, you make an assumption that you reinvest. Second question is, okay, if I reinvest, what's my assumption about the rate at which it's reinvested? In the NPV method, that assumption is that it's reinvested at, at WAC. In the IRR, the incorrect assumption is that it is reinvested at the IRR rate. So when you do the IRR for this project, you'll get a relatively high number. And according to that IRR method, the 80, has anybody calculated the IRR? About 30 percent? So IRR is approximately 38 percent. So the IRR will incorrectly assume that this 80 is reinvested at the, no, IRR will incorrectly assume that it's, uh, the money is reinvested at 38 percent. Okay, there's a problem. So, because of that incorrect assumption, the IRR is overstated. 
Okay. So now, uh, if uh, if your manager, if you're going for a job interview, and your your interviewer asks, which method would you rather use, NPV or IRR? What will you say? Okay. Actually, now, okay. The, the the best answer is that I will use both methods, but I will recognize that even though NPV is superior from a theoretical perspective, the IRR is still giving us some useful information. IRR, like most things in life, is not perfect. And in fact, everything in finance is not perfect. So everything is a model. So as long as you use something and you know the limitation, then it's all right. Okay, so the NPV of, a project, of the project I just showed you might be 30-something. Is that good or bad? What sort of a return am I getting? The NPV doesn't tell you that. IRR tells you that. So as long as you know that the project return is 37%, you know also that IRR is going to give you somewhat overstated number. Okay, so as long as you understand that, it's all right. But an even better thing to do is to go to another method called the modified IRR, which is a improved version of IRR. Okay, now how does this method work? I'm going to simply give you the, um, I'm going to make a couple of statements, have you sort of memorize these statements and then we'll use this information. So MIRR is the discount rate that causes the present value of a project's terminal value to equal the present value of costs. What does present value of costs mean? Yeah. You look at all your costs. In my project S and L, what were the costs? 100 at time 0. So what's the present for project S, what's the present value of cost at time 0? So the cost, if it's a cost, we know it's negative. So the present value of the cost is 100. What's, uh, what's the terminal value? Terminal value is found by compounding the inflows at VAC. So in project S, what were the inflows? There was a cash flow after one year, a cash flow after two years. So, so what, we, what we do in this method is we, we come up with a present value of all the cost. Then we come up with the terminal value of all the inflows. And then we figure out at what rate can we discount this terminal value to come up with the present value? For example, okay, so here is a situation. So here is one project. You invested 100, and then is there any other investment? So what's the present value of the cost? So the present value of the cost is 100. What is the terminal value? How do you come up with the terminal value? compound. At what rate do you compound? Yeah, so MIRR assumes that the compounding is happening at WAC. Is that a good assumption to make? Yes. Yeah, that's a better assumption than what IRR does. So when you compound at 10%, then what you have is, so 158 is called what? Yeah, this is the terminal value of all the project inflows. Okay, so that's the terminal value of the inflows. Now, if you have 158, 158 is the terminal value at time t equal to, is this beginning of year 3, end of year 3? Yeah, these are always end of year 3. So, you figure out what is the discount rate at which the present value of 158 becomes equal to 100. So, that is your MIRR. Okay, so um, um, Hassan, hmm? Adil, Adil. So what does this MIRR equal to 16.5 mean? So your boss asks you, what does the 16.5 percent mean? And he is not a finance guy. Your boss asks you that, what does the 16.5 percent represent? And assume that he is not a finance person. Yeah. So this is effectively the the return on the. So this is the return on the project, annualized return on the project. 
Okay, what next to Adil is? Umar. Okay, so Umar, uh, what do you think the MIRR rule is? Earlier we talked about an IRR rule. Do you remember what the IRR rule is? What is it? Okay. So, but I asked the question first. So, you are, your, 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 your question is about the mechanics of how we got it? My question is about right now and then I'll... How many people did not understand the mechanics? One. Okay, so if it's just one, then you see me after class. Okay, so assume for a moment that you plug numbers into a computer and it gives you the MIRR. My question is, which is generally more important, is what is the interpretation of 16.5% for, for you to do? And what do you think the MIRR rule is? Yeah, so the MIRR rule should be exactly the same. Then what's the benefit next to, so, uh, next to Omar is? Haneen. So why did we go through this long-winded exercise to come up? Okay, so the point is that MIRR is a improved version of IRR. Is it preferred over VAC or preferred over... Actually, actually, with MIRR and NPV, there will not be a conflict. No. So then the question... Both, 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 now... Now both NPV and MIRR make the same correct assumption that intermediate cash flows are reinvested at back. So if you look, what is the assumption? When, just take a step back for a second. When you calculated IRR, did you use VAC? No. You didn't use VAC. When you calculate MIRR, do you use VAC? Yes. You do. So both MIRR and NPV are based on, on using VAC. And they will give you the same except reject decisions for mutually exclusive projects. So there is no conflict. What would be the difference between NPV and MIRR? So, uh, so what, do, what do you think? Ne uh, name? No, next to you is? Falak. Okay, so answer to uh, the question. So the what's the? So next to Kinza, what's the difference between NPV and IRR? Difference between NPV and IRR. Uh, yeah, difference, so difference between NPV and MIRR. So, Umar, name? Name, 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 name. Asim. Awesome. NPV is in dollars and MIRR is in percentage. Exactly. So, NPV is, NPV is telling you what's the value created. MIRR is giving you a return. Okay, very basic. Do you, would you like to know both? Yeah, so both, you won't say I just want to use this. You know, both are telling you something useful. Okay. So, out of this slide, I want you to get two core messages. One message is the mechanics of calculating the MIRR, which is a high probability question on your quiz. And the second is the interpretation of MIRR, which is simply, it is a measure of the return. And it is better than IRR because it gives us, yeah, because it assumes correctly that intermediate cash flows are reinvested at WAC. Yeah, honey. Yeah, so, yeah, no, if you can calculate MIRR, then that is better than IRR. No, no, so, so if I ask, is A better or B better, and you say, no, C is better. Okay, so, uh, and are, are, you, are, you, are you with me right now or you're totally confused? Then we don't use IRR. What? Then we don't use IRR. Okay, so, okay, so, now, this is just a practical reality. Okay, please, one, one second. So, so between, between, please, just, okay, between IRR and MIRR, MIRR, MIRR is better. However, in the real world, most people are not familiar with MIRR. So they actually use IRR. But if you see somebody using IR, IRR, you need to recognize that, okay, it's telling you something, but there is a small flaw. Yeah, it overstates. Does it always overstate or does it only overstate if the IRR is greater than WAC? Yeah, if the project has an IRR that's greater than WAC, then... IRR will overstate. But the fact is that in many companies, 
IRR is used. Okay, but you are now smarter. You know that there is a better way. Yeah, they can use it. Yeah. True. Okay. So, the, uh, can you read this? Just can you read this? Does it make sense? Very good. Okay, so at least somebody is trying to read and. So that's the only thing I've not talked about so far. So the first part, MIRR correctly assumes reinvestment at opportunity cost, which is WAC, that we've talked about. The second part, MIRR avoids the multiple IRR. So I asked you to read this and you all nod, yeah, yeah, but I've, we've not. Hmm? Oh, you're still reading. Okay. Okay, okay, you need to learn to read faster. Okay, managers like the rate of return comparisons and MIRR is better than this for IRR. So I'm going to get into this. Within the next 5-10 minutes, we'll come up with the multiple IRR problem. Let's build up to it. Before we build up to it, a little bit of additional terminology. A normal cash flow is one where there is one sign change. So the point is, one sign change means you invest 100 and then after that you have plus 50, plus 60, and so on. How many sign changes in the cash flow? One. Okay, versus another project where you invest 100, and then say you get 500, and then in the end to shut down you need to invest another 300. How many sign changes? Two. So the second example is a non-normal cash flow, where you have more than one sign change. Okay. Where does this happen? In certain projects such as if you want to shut down a nuclear plant. Okay, so you build it, you generate money, and then do you just let it be and abandon it at the end, or do you spend some money and neatly close it down? Okay, depends which country you are in. <laughs> okay, but what you're supposed to do is, is just safely shut it down. Okay, so, so there is a cost. There are many projects where they are non-normal cash flows. Okay, so here is one example where you have minus 800, 5000 and minus 5000. What I want you to do is come up with the NPV profile of this project. And just as a hint, use a discount rate. Uh, do I need to give you a discount rate to do the... But it might just help you for this particular exercise. Use a discount rate k equal to 0. Then use k equal to 10, k equal to 20, k equal to uh, 400, and then k equal to 500. Yeah, just three cash flows, and you have a calculator. Uh, has, is anybody, you know... Okay, so when the discount rate is zero, that's the y-axis. What's your NPV? Okay, when the when the NPV was uh, when the discount rate was ten percent, you should have had some negative number. When the when the discount rate was twenty, you should have had something slightly negative. Then when you when I gave you hundred hundred percent. Then what was my next number? So after, after, okay, sorry. I should have, I should have given you a, but then you should have been smart enough to see that what's gap in the gap. Okay. So, so, no, so, so you, th this is what the, the profile should look like. Now, do you see, What's, uh, so, Temur, what's a multiple IRR problem? So, there will be certain cash flows where you will get multiple IRRs. I don't know. Can, does somebody know how to turn this thing off? Where's the switch? Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, so that's a multiple IRR problem. When you, so, another problem with IRR is that there will be certain cash flows where you will get multiple IRRs. On a calculator, you'll just get an error. So what is the IRR of this project? Is it 25%? Is it 40%? Do 
does a IRR, IRR of 25% help you? No. So when you have a multiple IRR issue, you just throw IRR out of the window. Okay, it doesn't help you at all. Will you ever have a multiple NPV issue? No, because NPV will always give you some NPV, positive, negative, zero, something you will get. With IRR, you can sometimes, is it possible that you have a cash flow where there is no IRR? Yeah, as in, is, isn't it conceivable to have some a profile that looks like this? Yeah, so it is conceivable that your uh, it is conceivable that your and let me let me just let let me just again just you know part of my purpose here is to is to make you to make you think harder. If somebody gives you limited data, so. For example, earlier, what are the data points that I gave you? I gave you 0, 10, 20, and then I jumped up to 400. So those who were doing this right would have plotted this point for 0. Then they would have plotted this point for 10, this point for 20. And then at 400, they would have come here. So if you have this point here and this point here, just if you are using your brain, what would you do next? You would try to figure out what is happening isn't that a logical thing to do? How many people actually did that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So anyway, so in in the real world, you will spoon feed that you will do this, do this, do this, do this, that you will give vague things and you will do something. Almost everything in the real world is vague. Okay. So okay. What okay, is it? No. If if or then just plug in another interest rate and figure out what's going on. हाँ सो वो तो आपको कौन कह रहा है कि अस्सीयों करें आप वो हर डिस्काउंट ले रेट लें और उसको देख लें क्या एनपीबी नो एनीवे सो सो ओके द बॉटम लाइन हेयर इज दैट देयर इज दिस इश्यू कॉल्ड अ मल्टीपल आईआरआर प्रॉब्लम व्हिच इज अनदर रीजन व्हाय आईआरआर इज डिफेक्टिव ओके जस्ट रीड दिस स्लाइड नाउ यू थ्रो अवे the IRR number that you get is meaningless. Yeah, then you can use MIRR. Do you think we'll have a multiple... Are you done reading this or are you still reading? Okay, read fast. Okay, read the rest at home. Okay, so if you use a calculator with IRR, what do you think will happen on this cash flow? Yeah, the calculator will just give you a error. Okay, can you, uh, can you calculate the... Do you remember the cash flow? So minus 800, 5,000 5, and calculate the MIRR. So dem okay. So okay. So so you uh, okay now. Just for, uh, just two minutes. Everybody quiet now. So if you if you just uh, if you understand, relax. If you don't understand, just listen for a minute. Okay. So what is step one with MIRR? It's the present value of of all your costs. What's the present value of the cost? Your cost is 800, initial cost. And your other cost was 5000 after two years. So that will give you minus. So your, your cost, your cost is 4932. Okay, so the cost is 4932. What is step two? The terminal value of the inflows. So what's the only inflow? Your five 5,000. So what's the terminal value at year 3? So that's 5,500. Now the MIRR is that discount rate which will make the present value of this equal to that. So you say that 4,932 is equal to 5,500 over 1 plus R squared. This R you calculate and you should get 5.6%. Now, according to the MIRR rule, so what is the MIRR rule? Tough. Okay, so that is it. You have a quiz on this chapter in the next class.